got my graduate degree from Miami of Ohio, and I didn't have a job. <laughs> so what did I do? I moved home. Mm-hmm. And I moved home uh, not knowing what my next move would be. I was making calls, asking people out there, sending things out. And my old man paid for me to uh, go to uh, real estate school. So he had been in real estate for over 30 years. I had a brother that was in real estate. I had no interest in real estate, um, but it was at that point, I think that was my, my only option uh, being home because, you know, mowing lawns could only take me so far. So I went through a summer of real estate school. Um, I did that and then got 80% passing grade. The afternoon that I found that out, I could still remember I was at uh, this place called Hondros College. And um, I'd taken the, the, the exam on a computer and I got a call while I was in there and it was uh, Jim Christian and it was an opening and uh, I went up the next day and got offered the job. What's going on today? I'm the host, Shoes, and joining me today is a longtime respected assistant coach at Miami University of Ohio, the University of Toledo, the University of Illinois, Butler University, and the Ohio State University, and now the 20th head coach of Illinois State, Ryan Peden. Coach, appreciate you taking time to come on today. Thanks, Shoes. Great to be with you, man. Absolutely. Well, for starters, I know you're getting ready to move. You're now a head coach. How's it feel to officially be in a coaching chair now and having the new position of head coach? Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's it's a great great feeling. It's been um, it's been a lot of fun so far. Um, some of the challenges that I anticipated coming in uh, have sort of uh, um, you know have presented themselves this spring, and um, we're excited about um, the program that we have and then where we're headed uh, as well. So exciting time for our family, exciting time for our staff, and um, it's exciting time to be a part of our, our Redbird basketball program. Obviously, it's only been a few months now, but what would you say has been the hardest part and what's maybe been the easiest and most enjoyable part so far of the move? I think the hardest part, um, when you're an assistant for so long, um, I've been an assistant for 21 years, so um, you, your mind and your actions are sort of programmed a certain way. Um, mm-hmm. you're, you're a guy that uh, gives advice or thoughts or options to, co- to the head coach um, and uh, tries to steer them you know, away from maybe potholes in the road. Um, when you're a head coach, you learn real quick that it's like you know, you're the guy that has to make the uh, ultimate decision um, on everything. So um, that it, I, I, I will say, I say hard because it's been different, you know, but um, I, I think, I think it's, um, you know, it's presented some situations that it maybe I anticipated and, and things that we've been through in the past. Uh, so that's been, that's been beneficial, but um, I'd say that's probably the biggest difference. Um, when you're head coach, you can make your own schedule. I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty good. Um you know, um, I haven't had a lot of time to go golfing or anything like that, but, um, you know, you're sort of dictating, um, the, the daily schedule. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of rhythm because we haven't had a full staff in yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were hiring our, our immediate staff, our, our on court, uh, assistant coaches, and, and we've, we've hired our support staff now, uh, our graduate assistants, and we're filling that out. So, um, it's been a transition, uh, a couple of months for us, but, um, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and, and, uh, looking forward to getting these guys here in June so we can really start to establish a, a rhythm, uh, of our program. Absolutely. We're going to get more into this program and becoming a head coach, your goals later on, but I want people to get to know how you become the coach that you are today. It's long journey. So for starters, you've been pretty much out in the same area around there for a while now. You grew up out there in Ohio. So. For starters, what was it like growing up out there in Ohio? Well, Ohio uh, is all I knew uh, until, you know, I was, first time I moved out of the state was not till after I was 30 years old. So mm-hmm. um, uh, I, it was all I knew. I obviously was born and raised here in Columbus. I went to school about an hour and a half up the road, uh, up towards about halfway between Columbus and, and Cleveland mm-hmm. um, at the College of Worcester. And then... Um, bounced around the state really within the mid-American conference 
I did two years as a grad assistant at Miami of Ohio, three years under Jim Christian at Kent State University, went back to Miami uh, as a full-time assistant for five, and then up to University of Toledo for three years. So mm-hmm. uh, up to that point, uh, I had lived in Ohio my entire life. And I will say this, maybe this is something that um, younger co- coaches can, can learn from or take something from, but early on in my career, I um, uh, there was a notion that you had to get out and experience um, other areas and other regions. And um, I do think there's probably some benefit to that uh, mm-hmm. for sure. You know, taking yourself out of a comfortable situation and can you uh, learn how to adapt and build relationships in other regions outside of your comfort zone? I think there's definite um, potential advantages to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think ultimately my familiarity with Ohio the Midwest as a whole, um, being that all 21 of my years as an assistant coach were in this three state yeah. region within five hours of, of my hometown. Um, I think that played to my advantage. So um, I think there's positives and negatives of that, but um, I wouldn't want to, you know, if I was kind of elaborating on my past and my, my trajectory, I would say, um, it was helped by the fact that I was within this region for a long time. And um, I, I think of a guy like Dwayne Stevens, who got the job at Western Michigan, and his path has been somewhat similar. He was at Marquette mm-hmm. for a while, but he's been he's been very concentrated in, in his professional area. Um, and I think at the end of the day, there, there's real advantages to that. And, uh, and uh, you know, everybody has a different path and there's different ways of getting there. That just happened to be mine. It is a unique piece about you because, as you said, it's, it's that kind of that, with a quote that saying people say to kind of control the region or control an area. And that is valuable. I mean, there obviously might be a few exceptions. Obviously, when you get to like an Ohio State, you can recruit from wherever and kids will still look at that as a potential place to go. But especially when you're at 95 percent of school, if not more than that, it is about bringing the hometown kids or these kids in the area. So how big is that? And also, like, how do you do that? How do you end up controlling a region where, you know, the local high school coaches or the AAU programs, you know, the local kids? How do you kind of get to that point where you, quote unquote, do control a region? Well, I think um, our profession is not unlike many others. Um, yeah. Familiarity can breed success. Um, relationships drive probably 80 percent of what you do as an assistant coach. Um, mm-hmm. And our success um, uh, that we've had and programs I've been a part of and been fortunate to work under some great head coaches. But I think a lot of our recruiting success was built on relationships that our staff has held over time. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're doing things the right way, uh, you carry yourself with a certain amount of class and dignity and you, you, you work to, to develop kids uh, the right way and you care about what's best for them and their growth. Um, I think you'll find more times than not that, um, you know, people around those recruiting situations will appreciate uh, who you are and how you're, you're going about your business. So um, and, and in today's world where, where it's so, uh, you know, it's so mobile and fluid uh, with the transfer rules, I think relationships become even more important. And uh, I think that, you know, I think that's been a benefit of maybe some programs I've been a part of. And uh, the staff that we had at Ohio State these last few years is, is, is no exception. We, we had I worked with some talented guys and um, I learned a lot from them along the way, too. So going a little bit more into your journey, then you played basketball obviously, throughout college. Was coaching the ultimate goal growing up for yourself? Like, were you someone that said, you know, I love this game. Let's play it as long as I can for that through high school or college, potentially professional as a dream growing up? Or was it all along saying, you know, I want to get to that point where I'm a head coach. I want to become a coach someday. When did that dream come to you? Well, I, I, I've always wanted to be a head coach. Um, when I was younger, I would have done anything to be a head coach. There's division three jobs that I applied for and interviewed for and didn't get uh, along the way. Um, I'm a division two job, same, same thing. So I've I, I, now my, my mode of getting there, uh, you know, um, was a little bit different as I got older and what I valued, I think changed as I got older, but I've always wanted to be a head coach. Um, I think in these last five to seven years of my career, I I began to appreciate uh, the importance of fit and timing and um, both uh, played a a real role in in this job um, 
in taking this job here at Illinois State. I, I felt strongly about uh, the opportunity and uh, the timing was right for me uh, personally. And I do think that, um, you know, I think the fit was exactly what I was looking for. So um, it, ha it had me very excited from the start. And um, I think you have to, you got to evaluate. We're all different. Um, we all have different paths, but I think you have in our, in our profession, you got to evaluate what's important to you. And then, um, and then, you know, more importantly, like what's your, your, your path or your, your idea of getting uh, to that ultimate goal. And for me, um, my, my biggest key was being around the right people. And uh, it's at the core of my belief system. I'm thankful um, that um, I was able to be in these situations. And there's some key people along the way that paved my entire route to get there. So um, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm thankful. And, and, and I trust me when I say I'm very humble in um, my approach because I know uh, I could have never gotten to a position even after 21 years of being a head coach without other people helping me along the way. And uh, I'm thankful for that. You mentioned that you were trying to apply for a D3 coaching job. D2, you didn't get those. So obviously becoming a coach at the Division three or D2 level, it still could have been possible to become a D1 head coach, but probably would have been maybe a little bit longer, a little more, more tricky, obviously, to work your way up. But when exactly were you trying to get those jobs? Like, was that earlier on in your career, most past like 10, 15 years time? Or when did you actually try doing that? There were a couple of different times uh, dating back to my days, even at Kent State. I'd applied for um, a couple of jobs and uh, I really one of them I didn't even get a sniff for. Um, and I look back on it and I, I laugh because I um, I do feel like I could have been uh, very happy and content uh, having a program that you could call your own, um, and regardless of, um, you know, level or size or, um, you know, visibility of the program. Uh, there's a part of me at my core that appreciates uh, basketball and team building uh, yeah. beyond all of the other stuff. And um, it's nice to have crowds. It's great to be on big stages and uh, imply on platforms where you can coach, you know, under high, high stakes. Um, but, um, I played division three college basketball and I played JV college basketball, uh, my freshman year. And, uh, so I, I come, uh, to this point, uh, you know, very humbly. And, uh, I feel like it's, it's helped me along the way to develop a chip on my shoulder. And, uh, and like I said, uh, you know, having, uh, the experiences that I have had there, um, even dating back to my JV college days. A, a quick story here, but my JV college coach was Lamont Paris, who's mm. now the head coach mm -hmm. at the University of South Carolina. He's one of my best friends uh, yeah. in the world now. And um, it's, it's kind of a crazy situation there, but uh, he was working in the admissions office, would come over after work and uh, we'd always practice later because he couldn't get off work until later. And, um, you know, he was my, my coach and we had some... We had some we had some fun times back then, man, uh, riding the vans and uh, playing. We played junior colleges. We played Division two schools. We, we, we played anybody we could find a game with. So uh, taught me a lot of life lessons and, uh, you know, thankful for that experience in particular. That is one of the cool things about being a coach, because there are so many connections where it's a big world. But at the same time, it's such a small world because you get a cross path with so many guys that end up becoming head coaches or highly respected assistant coaches throughout your journey. What's it like seeing guys like Lamont Paris now and like yourself now and just seeing all these other coaches like Good Diebler, I'm sure will be a head coach in the future. Like the list goes on of just coaches you've been around, you just grew close with that have now reached the ultimate goal that they've had of becoming head coaches. Seeing the way you guys' careers have all unfolded like that, what's that been like seeing? Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's one of the, the parts of our world and our business that I think I appreciate the most. Um, because, you know, the journey, right? Like everyone's journey is so different. I sat in gyms with Chris Holtman when he was an assistant coach at Ohio University. We were both assistants mm -hmm. and sat in, uh, you know, those, those uh, gyms with him. And now, you know, look at him. He's the head coach at Ohio State and um, he's, do he's doing great things. Uh, Brad Stevens is a good friend of mine. We used to work mm -hmm. camps at Butler. I'd go over there. Uh, back when Hinkle Fieldhouse had no air conditioning, so you would sweat all day long. We'd go back to his house, and he had a, he had like a, it was a two-story house, but 
up the stairs was the bedroom or he and his wife's bedroom. And that's it. That's all that was upstairs. <laughs> I would sleep on his lazy boy at night and I was out. Uh, but it was, it was, I enjoyed that air conditioning, you know, so we'd come back, watch the NBA playoffs at his house, grab some dinner and then uh, fall asleep there. So, and then of course he's, you know, his path, everyone knows uh, Brad's mm-hmm. uh, tremendous path that he's had. So um, it's been, it's been fun. It's fun to, no guys uh, that have gone on to experience great success. And it's also good to kind of watch how guys' careers evolve from afar. I think it's one of the, the like I said, the things that I enjoy and appreciate the most uh, about our profession. And you're able to learn um, and see what makes uh, certain guys uh, successful. And I think at the core of it um, is, is, is built on, on, obviously there's an intelligence level required, but the, uh, the common denominator that I see is, is relationships and how they're able to uh, affect other people uh, through their relationships and through the way that they carry themselves. And um, I feel fortunate to be in a, been, a, been around some guys that do that at a high level. And if I can steal a trick or two uh, from them along the way, then I'll have been a better coach because of it. Going a little bit more into your playing career there, you obviously, it's not necessarily where you play professional or whatever it is, or even play at the high level division one, but you still were a player at the, at the collegiate level. How would you say getting that experience now of playing basketball at the next level helped you now as a coach, either early on in your career, or even today now kind of getting to in a way relate to and understand the way the players are going through their day-to-day lives? Sure. Well, I think um, some of my experiences, while they're different than a lot of the these high level division one athletes, um, I can always point to my experiences in college and relate to them um, in, in a lot of different ways. As a competitor, obviously, um, not getting what you want uh, in your college career and then coming to a realization of what your path was versus what you thought your path would be. Um, and, and then how to handle that. You know, I consider myself really lucky to have played Division three basketball in the program that I played in highly successful program. I might've been a very small, small part of that um, later, later in my career, but um, I had to carve out uh, my niche and figure out how I could help uh, the team. And maybe that was in a small way or two, um, but um, sort of learning what in a group setting, what my strengths were um, and how I could implement those um, in, in affect the, the culture and locker room, uh, of our team. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think there's a lot of team, uh, type of lessons that I, I was able to learn, um, you know, facing adversity, uh, developing a real chip on your shoulder and, um, you know, um, what are you going to do with those? And, and ultimately how will you respond to the adversity that you face in college? Um, and that's one of the things I love most about coaching is, is, is being able to help young people um, through their adversities and, and uh, you know, come out on the other side, uh, a better person, a better player, a better leader because of those, those experiences. So your playing career comes to conclusion then at the 2000 to the 2000 season then, and you end up deciding to go into your coaching career then. You start off as a grad assistant out there at Miami, Ohio. What led to that opportunity? Like, why was that the program that you got an opportunity at and what brought you there? Well, relationships, my, um, you know, I get questions like this from time to time from some of our graduate assistants or managers, you know, that want to get into the profession. What can I do? And the reality is relationships for the most part are built eyeball to eyeball, face to face. And if you can be around people, I think you, that's the best way to, um, you know, to build those types of relationships that are, that are, that are transformative. Uh, for me, um, one of my former teammates at Worcester was a volunteer assistant in Miami of Ohio. Mm-hmm. He had me down to uh, work camp. So I worked camp there for a couple of years. I was able to build rela- a close relationship with James Whitford, um, who was an assistant in Miami of Ohio, went on to be the head coach at Ball State University. Um, but James and I shared an office uh, in my first you know, few years there at Miami in um uh, I was able to build that relationship with the staff um, just just by working camps and then being present. I came to practices on my winter break. I came to a game. Uh, my going into my senior was my senior year in college. I drove down uh, over winter break for a game and 
Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think um, that was a, you know, the, the, the experiences I had building relationships through camps uh, were really important. And then any sort of uh, bridge that you have with a, with a program or a manager or a grad assistant, um, can you connect the dots um, and, and meet more people through that one person? Um, that's what I tried to do uh, when I was, you know, in my younger years, trying to get into the profession. So you're at this point in time now where obviously you're kind of getting ready to go into this long journey of trying to become a head coach eventually. What, what did you think was going to happen though? Because each coach is like you said, journey is different. Some are young enough where they become a head coach early on in their early thirties, maybe just getting into the early forties. Others take a little bit longer. Some wait until they're 50 or 60, whatever it might be. What were your expectations? Like, did you think it was going to be a quick journey up there? Did you think, okay, no, I might never become a head coach or what were your original expectations when you first got going into this journey? Well, I think, you know, you're naive a little bit when you first get in the profession because you, you you look at certain guys that were on the fast track and you think you're the next version of that or that you could be the next version of that. Yeah. And, and, you know, for some guys, they are or they're able to follow that path. But, um, you know, I, I came from, uh, you know, humble beginnings, a Division three college athlete. Um, I didn't have a big time connection. So for me, I think it took um, – uh, a period of time to build those. And then you, you build a reputation along the way. Um, but I think it's, it's not unlike anything else in life. It's probably not going to end up how you envision it in the big picture. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't get consumed with that. I, I, my advice would be, um, you know, there's a certain level of understanding that's required. I would say the same thing to players coming into college, the perfect view of how you, you envision this thing going it's not uh, going to necessarily end up uh, going that way. And it's those that embrace that and are able to kind of capitalize on that, uh, that path that they, they do forge for themselves, um, which is what I think I did over the long haul. Now, if you would have told me it was 21 years later, I don't know what my 22 year old self would have thought of that, but um, looking back on it, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I think the lessons I was able to learn, I think uh, were, were invaluable. And I think at this point in my career, as I start um, this job from a different seat as a head coach, uh, I think my most valuable asset as a coach is my experience. So um, that I feel uh, very thankful for and, uh, you know, anxious to, to, to turn the page and start that next chapter. At any point throughout this 21 year journey, did you get to a point where you're like, you know, this is taking a little bit longer than I expected. This is taking a little bit longer. Why am I not moving up the ranks quicker? Or did, did everything just kind of kind of unfold in the way you kind of were in a comfortable setting where you're kind of like, okay, you know, I feel like I'm in the right spot where I should be at, at this point in time. Yeah, I think I think I was always around great people and people I believed in. So I never felt like um, I wasn't where I was supposed to be. Okay. But certainly there's factors that can lead you down one path or the other. And um you know, for me, not getting a couple of jobs um, may have helped me in the long run. But at the time, you know, I was really bummed out or um, disappointed or whatever it might be. But I think the longer you're in this profession, you realize how uh, hard uh, getting jobs can be, uh, whether that's as an assistant coach, whether that's trying to break into the business as a graduate assistant or director of basketball operations or ultimately a head coach. Um, you know, I was able to gain an appreciation for how uh, how hard that was and uh, makes you more appreciative, I think, on the other end. I know these are probably the two most important traits in terms of a coach is connections and obviously the individual talent of how you are as a coach. But if you could pick one of those two that's the most important attribute, would you say having the longest list of connections, like let's you knew per se Coach K or whatever might have been, or if you just were the talent of a Coach K type of person, what would you say would be the most important attribute or most important piece about a head coach or a coach trying to become a head coach to say? Um, I would say the most important attribute would be your ability to um, influence and affect other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, big picture, that's relationships and building relationships. But um, as you start to narrow that, what I just said there, um, I think the ability uh, to lead is ultimately the uh, ability to influence others. Mm -hmm. And um, that influence comes through trust and through communication and through connection. But your ability to influence others um, is, is much about your ability to 
uh, affect their way of thinking. Uh, that I, I think that if I were saying, you know, what's probably the most, I think, I think guys that are skilled in that area, having an, an emotional intelligence and ability to connect and communicate with a variety of uh, different people from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, kind of stuff uh, uh, will can contribute to the longevity in our profession more than anything. You could be a great X's and O's coach uh, and, and be able to exist for a period of time. But at the end of the day, to, to gain this longevity uh, of career, which is what we're all uh, after, at least most of us are, um, I think you need the, the more relational um, attributes than, than anything else. So that's why I would say that. Well, let's hop back into your next stop. Then you decide after becoming a grad assistant to go out to the Kent State for about three years there and you become the diva out there. So take us that option. Like what brought you out there to Kent State then? Well, funny story. So, um, and this is good for, this might be good for younger coaches to hear kind of different paths here, but um, my two years at Miami of Ohio were done. Um, I had to move out. My stipend was done at the end of the school year. I got my graduate degree from Miami of Ohio and I didn't have a job. So what did I do? I moved home and I moved home uh, not knowing what my next move would be. I was making calls, asking people out there, sending things out, I don't even think email existed back then. That shows you how long ago that was. But, um, you know, sending letters out, sending resumes out, things like that from home. Um, And my old man paid for me to uh, go to uh, real estate school. So he had been in real estate for over 30 years. I had a brother that was in real estate. I had no interest in real estate. Um, But it was at that point, I think that was my my only option uh, being home because you know, mowing lawns could only take me so far. So I uh, went through a summer of real estate school. Um, I did that. And then um, I, I remember I passed, I can't remember if it was 80% was the passing grade. I think it was 80%. And I got right on the number. I got 80% passing grade. The mm-hmm. afternoon that I found that out, I could still remember I was at uh, this place called Hondros College. And um, I'd taken the, the, the exam on a computer and I got a call while I was in there and it was uh, Jim Christian and he called and asked me to come up. Um, they had a guy that had just taken a job in August, of, which is late. I mean, you know that uh, and mm-hmm. the hiring cycle. So this is August. Nobody really gets hired in August. They had a guy uh, that took a job and left. Uh, it was an opening and uh, I went up the next day and got offered the job. So uh, I got this uh, break at Kent State University and I had this real estate license that I had, I now had that I never, ever used. So mm-hmm. I went up to Kent State. I remember I was making $12,000 a year. I did that for three years. I was working study tables from Sunday through Thursday night for 20 bucks a night. That was a big deal. And then uh, I was selling ADT security systems on the side. <laughs> so um uh, you know, that, that's a, you know, that's a humbling, um, time, but looking back on it, but, uh, at the same time, I, I was not even batting an eye, uh, in that moment. I was, I was so thankful to have a job that actually had benefits and, um, I was making some money on the side. So, uh, that was great. And, and that was, uh, that was sort of my, my, you know, saving grace there was Jim Christian hiring me or else, uh, I, I may have never gotten into the profession. That's one of the cool things about another thing about coach's journey is because first of all, every coach has a, a crazy story about especially growing up and getting into this business because the first so many years, you're not going to make a lot of money. It's going to be paycheck to paycheck type of situation. So how living in that mentality, that kind of lifestyle for a few years there, especially in the early parts of your career, how has that kind of made you into the person that you are today now? Well, I think it makes you more appreciative, you know, um, looking back, it makes me more appreciative because of the people I was around. The guy who gave me a break, Jimmy Christian, uh, is a guy that I consider a very uh, close friend and mentor to this day. The guys that were on that staff, Rob Senderoff, one of my very best friends in the business, guy that I lean on a lot. Gino Ford was on that staff, head coach at Stony Brook. And he's, uh, if you ever need a laugh or you want a good interview, he'd be a great guy for you to interview. Um, Tremendous personality. I learned a lot from him. And then Rob Murphy, who is now uh, working in the Detroit Pistons organization, former head coach at Eastern Michigan University. Um, so a bit, I was around, again, going back to what I said at the beginning of the conversation, I'm fortunate 
because I've been around really talented people. And uh, I'm really thankful for that. And um, uh, learning from those guys as, as a young buck helped me a lot. It humbled me a lot. They humbled me a lot at times. Um, and without that sort of tutelage, you know, who knows uh, what path I, I would my career would have taken. But I allowed those guys to kind of be like big brothers to me and um, shape me and mold me as a coach and uh, and help me with my mentality, too. I think that's required because those are all uh, intensely uh, you know, competitive guys. And uh, Rob Senderoff, like myself, uh, really came from nothing. Uh, he was a former manager at Miami of Ohio. Uh, so uh, he built a career and carved a niche out for himself um, through hard work and uh, blue collar mentality. And that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, I owe a lot to him because he's, he is, uh, he's impacted my, not only my career, but my thinking along the way and uh, how to approach things. He's the all-time winningest head coach in the history of Kent State University. And you're mm -hmm. talking about a guy that, you know, carved a, a path for himself. And um, so I, I learned a lot from him and really appreciative of all those guys. That's something I know that not a lot of people re recognize, obviously, because obviously you're not going to know all these coaches are going to have the types of careers they have when they are assistants. And I think a lot of people saw this passion in the NFL playoffs when they showed the old commanders team with all the, all the assistant coach Sean McVay and Kyle Shannon all in the same coaching staff before. But not like I said, not a lot of people realize that or at least connect the dots until later on in the lives that they even do. So when you are going through this journey and you're coaching alongside three or four of the guys that eventually become head coaches, how do you learn from them as assistant coaches? I know a lot of people might say, oh, you have Chris Holtman that you get to learn from. You have Charlie Cross Cole that you get to learn from. How also at the same time do you learn from the other assistants that you're working alongside throughout your career? Well, I think you have to, a lot of that is in your approach, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 again, take the business world or any profession that you want. If you walk in thinking that you have all the answers or uh, you walk in with a mindset that you, that you know everything or that you're uh, the guy, you're going to miss uh, opportunities to learn from guys that are directly beside you. And I'm, uh, I'm thankful for the guys that I've worked alongside as much as the guys that I worked for. Um, and I was, I was the younger guy for a long time. And then I looked up here on staff at Ohio State and I was like, oh, man. A couple of years ago, I was like, I'm the oldest dude here now. I'm, you know, the roles have kind of reversed. And that was that was really odd for me. Uh, I believe that you you learn from uh, I think the people that are best at what they do um, have a real beginner's mindset and they're able to learn from experiences all around them. Um, and I was able to learn from some guys that I worked with. I was able to learn from other guys uh, that I sat with on the road or forged relationships with. And um, sometimes you know, people won't even know that you're learning from them, but I like to observe people, how they go about their business. And then I love learning from uh, successful people and learning about successful people and what makes them uh, successful in all that they do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but uh, again, I've 21 years, I've worked with a lot of people. So uh, that's been, that's been really cool, man. So the one coach you were being, next to that whole time during out there in Kent State was, as you said, Jim Christian. So take us to him a little bit. Like, what would you say is the biggest thing you learned from him? Uh, intense competitor. You know, I think Jimmy Christian, um, I've always said uh, this, he's, he has a rare combination of high level uh, intelligence and intense competitiveness uh, in between the lines. Uh, that dude loves to have fun off the court. Um, he golfs. We golfed more on that staff, I think, than any staff I've ever been a part of. He loved that. Um, he loves horse racing. So I spent some time as a younger coach at the, at the racetrack with him as well. Um, and then, uh, but um, if he were not in uh, coaching, I've always said he'd be like a trial. He could be a trial lawyer, a world-class trial lawyer. Um, he's, he is, uh, you know, he's just very uh, smart, very intelligent. And uh, I learned a lot from him at a, at a young age, just in terms of kind of uh, how to how to uh, run an organization. And, and he he took over a situation that was highly successful. Um, Kent State was coming off of an elite eight appearance. He was handed the head coaching job and uh, he really kept that going at a high level and parlayed that into a job uh, at uh, TCU from there. So 
he was a tremendous coach. Great, great for me to learn from. And, uh, and I think your habits are shaped by the people that you work for. And uh, he made sure that I was on point and, you know, highly disciplined in all I did in my role. And, uh, you know, I think that helped me uh, as my, as my future unfolded. There's a few players that we're going to touch up on throughout this interview, but this is the first guy I want to get into in this year's team because you're around probably the best athlete that you got to coach throughout your entire college career. And that's Antonio Gates, who obviously is one of not the best transition from basketball to football stars we've had. So you get to be around him who was an all conference player. He's one heck of a player out there at Kent State. Then he also becomes a legendary tight end. We now know him as when you were coaching him, what was it like being around him throughout that year? Antonio, um, he's, he's just a raw athlete, man. Um, his approach was, um, very unique. His competitiveness was high level on the court, but, uh, he was such a fun loving guy off the court. And in a lot of ways, he was almost like a, like a, you know, middle schooler, just playing, you know, he was just playing just, you know, you go out and you play baseball and then it's track season and it's, a, you know, basketball season or football season. And he's just an athlete that was playing, um, tremendous competitor, but, uh, you know, I, I probably didn't appreciate it at the time. What, what an unbelievable athlete he was. Um, and to think that uh, his career evolved from being an all conference guy, um, at Kent state, he was a, he was a big time basketball player to now being a first ballot hall of famer as a, as a tight end and never took a snap in college. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but mm-hmm. he's one of those uh, rare breeds that, um, you know, I, I was really fortunate to have been able to coach him, but that dude, he, he was something else. He had a lot of fun. He was easy to coach, um, uh, had a lot of fun doing what he was doing. And I don't think ever took it so serious that he lost perspective. He, he, he had a real joy about him that, um, you know, resonated and, and it helped, you know, I remember that, uh, about him distinctly. And, uh, I think it's probably one of the things that, uh, contributed to his, his longevity as a football player too. He played 10 plus seasons in the NFL. So, um, he's, a, he's a great guy, great personality. And, um, it was a lot of fun to coach. So what would you say is your funniest or maybe even the craziest story that you remember back of rather be at practices off the court during a game that you remember of him? Well, I would say this, um, I was in charge. So this was his, his final year at Kent state, but in order for him to remain eligible, he had to pass this class and we got him in like a two hour class Mm -hmm. and it was on Saturday mornings and it was a wine tasting class. And so it was Saturday mornings and they were like, Tony, you cannot miss this class. It was like eight, I think it was eight o'clock class on Saturdays and they would meet somewhere and then drive off to a vineyard or whatever. So I was in charge of making sure that he was up. So I had to be there like every Saturday at like seven 30 in the morning at his apartment complex. And if he was not out there at seven 45, I would call him. And I, this one particular Saturday I called and there was no answer. And then I called and there was no answer. So I finally went up to his apartment and I pounded on the door, you know, knocking on the door. He answered finally after a, about a minute or so. And I said, Tone, you got to go. You got to go. And he said, my bad. He said, I was sleeping. OK, I said, no problem. So I went down. I was about to leave. And I said, well, let me just wait here just in case. And he didn't come back down. <laughs> so uh, I had to go back up there. Consequently, I had to go back up there, hurry him along and make sure he got to class. But um, yeah, that wine tasting class on Saturday mornings. I mean, what I wouldn't have given to have that class in my college years. That would have been, <laughs> would have been a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, he, he was, he was, uh, he was easy to work with. Tone was not a, not a problem. Uh, but, you know, we, we had to, we had to uh, kind of chase him around there a little bit uh, to make sure his, his, his books were in order. So then it comes to 2005 and you decide to take your next opportunity, which is your first time as an official assistant coach now out there back at Miami, Ohio. So walk us to that move then. What took you obviously from out there at Kent State to getting your very first assistant coaching job? So, okay, uh, Kent State, I was trying to get an assistant from Kent State for three years, couldn't get any breaks, couldn't get any breaks. So here I am, age 28, um, still not having an opportunity to coach on the floor and recruit on the road and um, selling security systems, you know, and um, and in all the time I went and tried to sell security systems, by the way, I sold one. 
<laughs> and I got a hundred bucks from it. So I was like <laughs> one for like 27. Um, but, but I, I remember um, in this spring, this particular spring, this is uh, spring of 05 mm -hmm. and um, Larry Hunter had just got the job at Western Carolina. Uh, Gino Ford, who I worked with at Kent state had played for Larry. So he uh, got me in the door with Larry. Larry called and uh, he said, Hey, come on down interview. I went down there to call uh, uh, North Carolina. And, uh, and it, it was in the middle of nowhere. I've never been there obviously before and um, stayed overnight. He offered me the job the next morning. He said, think about it. He said, S you know, sleep on it. If you need to talk to your family, job yours on my way back. I had found out um, James Whitford had just gotten offered or just taken assistant job on Sean Miller's staff at Xavier. Mm. So now there's an opening in Miami of Ohio. So what do I do? I call up Charlie Coles uh, and see, I was like, coach, here's my situation. What are you, you know, what do you, what will you, do you know what you'll do? Mm -hmm. And uh, by the end of the day, he had offered me the job at Miami of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I've been in the business for what, five years. I'm age uh, 28, 27, going on 28 and um, never had a chance to be on the floor. And now all of a sudden within a 24 hour span, I had two job offers. And uh, I ended up taking uh, the Miami of Ohio job offer uh, over the uh, Western Carolina one, mostly because of uh, proximity to home. I yeah. felt really bad because uh, Larry, you know, offered me the job first, but sort of the way that it worked out was crazy. And, um, you know, thankful that I got an opportunity to work for Charlie. Charlie was really, really special to me um, as a mentor, like a father figure. And as a boss, I just, I, I love that guy and love being around him. He's, he was a special, special person. So, um, yeah, I was fortunate there, but kind of a crazy story how I got to that. So obviously you go with him up until 2010 and obviously you also were him as a grad assistant. So what were the biggest things you took from him then? Like, what was the biggest things that you learned from Charlie Coles? Well, I would say his old school mentality and how that, uh, how that, um, that carries on over time. It's, I think there's some time tested um, core values and principles that he um, applied his teaching with that um, will live on in our game forever. Just the simple things of, about uh, the commitment and discipline that's required um, on a daily basis, um, how exact and specific he was with his teaching principles, um, how you can, uh, you know, uh, impact uh, the game through giving yourself a chance in every game. I felt like anytime we played a high major program, uh, we would have a chance in those games. I felt like because of, of our, our toughness, our discipline and our, our defense, uh, maybe not the best offensive teams there, but um, you know, I learned so much about him in terms of his toughness and discipline and uh, just how that correlates to winning. And um, and then he was a master motivator, I would say, on top of that. Charlie was, um, you know, for five consecutive years, his teams went to the MAC championship game. I think they won two of those five. But, um, you know, playing your best uh, in March, in February and March uh, is crucial. And uh, it, when you're in a mid-major program, especially. And uh, uh, to be able to do that and learn from him along the way, um, was, was awesome. And, uh, he's very, very much an old school guy, old school philosophies, things that would never change over time. And, uh, I, I really respected that about him. And I, I, I apply a lot of his teaching principles to, to what I do now as, as a head coach. I have to imagine that the most notable, or at least your, probably your favorite season there was year two for yourself. You guys make your very first in-state tournament appearance as a coach now. What was that opportunity like and just getting to go and experience March Madness firsthand now on the core as assistant coach? What was that experience like? Yeah, so the um, it, it was awesome to answer your question. The the way that we did it was uh, even more special. We we hit a, a bank shot three at the buzzer mm. uh, after um, Cedric Middleton for uh, University of Akron had missed the front end of a one and one. They thought the game was over. It was five seconds to go. They're up two. And had he made both, I believe that would have given them a four point lead. Mm -hmm. um, but he missed the front end of the one and one. Uh, they go down. Uh, we go down advance pass and then hit a bank shot three. And uh, and 
you know, the rest is history. So it's, it was a crazy uh, moment in time. It's a moment I'll never forget as a, as a head coach. And that team was really special. That group of guys was really special and, and uh, certainly a memory that we'll, we'll cherish for forever and ever. I go back about once a year and YouTube it, but we'll, <laughs> you know, a couple of guys on the team will send, send a clip of it to, to each other and kind of uh, remember it, but it was, it was awesome. And, and uh, something I, I'll never forget. So then 2010 comes around and you decide to take the job out there at Toledo. What happened to their opportunity? You obviously got there with Coach Kowalczyk then, who's been a phenomenal coach out there at Toledo. How did you get that opportunity? Yeah, so um, Todd came from um, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Green Bay. His assistant there, uh, Brian Wardle, got the head coaching job at Green Bay. And I was um, – I was uh, – inquiring about the job through uh, Rob Senderoff. As a matter of fact, Rob was, Rob was good friends uh, with Kowalczyk. Jimmy Christian was good friends with him and uh, inquired kind of through them. He needed a guy that was from Ohio and from the region. And it just, it just so happened that it worked out. The timing worked out uh, really well. Uh, Toledo at that time was, was not, uh, you know, was not in, in great shape, but mm -hmm. Todd was uh, a builder and a program builder. And he, um, he did an unbelievable job of, of, you know, building that, that thing um, his way from day one, um, you know, and it was a, it was, the first year was, was painful. First year we were four and 28. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, from there, we won, I believe we won 19 games in year two. And then year three, we were MAC West Division champions. So, um, you know, in a span of 36 months, going from four and 28 and having one of the, you know, the worst uh, teams, I think, or, or rosters or years <laughs> in the country, uh, it was just, it was sort of a mess at that particular time. But, um, um, you know, to, to win the conference championship in year three, and we fought adversity. We had APR issues, so we couldn't even go to the postseason that year. Right. Um, it was pretty special. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot through him. He's, he's a tremendous uh, head coach. He's had great success. His, his you know, his uh, successes are well documented. He's had great success there at Toledo and has built that program into a consistent winner. So I uh, was able to learn a lot from him. Tremendous CEO and uh, can run a, a program from top to bottom as well as any, any guy, I think, in the country. It's got a little bit off topic, but you've now listed about four or five seasons now that you remember the exact record you guys had at the end of that season. So <laughs> is that something that you can go back and remember, like just about every year you've been in this business, can you remember just about every record you guys finished in? Or is that just something that's more recent or just something you're standing out more than others? Or Yeah, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I remember, I think, a lot of it. I, probably... Mm -hmm. You know, there's some things I, I obviously don't remember or, or forget or games I forget, but um, I try to recall my experiences, uh, you know, from time to time. I try to go back and look at some of those rosters and schedules. I like to keep in touch with uh, guys that were on teams. Relationships are really important to me and um, social media helps that. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 I think about those a lot. I talk about them a lot. Again, going back to what I said earlier about uh, experience, I think experience can be a very powerful, um, you know, attribute uh, if it's used in the right way. And um, yep. I can, you know, talk to you about some of the, the trials and tribulations that I've had and been a part of programs have been a part of uh, at a pretty high level. But, um, you know, uh, if those experiences help shape me and in, in my career as well. So you, how many years do you think you're going to roll you could probably get out of your career in terms of like exact record? Do you think you could get five, 10, 15, all of them, or how many do you not, get? Not as many as you would think. No, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. Cause you know, the Miami Ohio years were, were they, come, they sort of jumble up a little bit because um, we had a handful of years where it was like, we were right at 500, but it was because uh, if you go look at our non-conference schedules, Charlie Coles was, he didn't care. He didn't <laughs> care. We played like, I mean, we would play five or six, or seven high majors every year. And um, we'd limp into the conference season, you know, like lacking some, some severe confidence, you know, like, uh, you know, we were like three and eight uh, every year, you know, and then we'd turn around and do really well in the league, uh, you know, it taught me, uh, you know, the benefits of it, but also uh, I think there's a, a necessary balance that's required too, but he was, he was something else, man. He would, he would tell the team all the time. He'd say, if you see me fighting a bear, he said, don't save me. He said, 
pour honey on me. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, let me fight the bear. He's like, that's what I, that's what I do. You know? So that was his, uh, you know, that was sort of his, his, his mantra. And um, that's how he lived, man. That's how he lived. If anybody, if you know, Charlie Coles, you know, that um, he feared no one. And uh, he instilled that in his players and his staff as well. We have to go a little bit deeper into that first year out there at Toledo, because going and only winning four games in a season, obviously is not the goal of any coach. It's not what you want to go through or player. So how did that year make you and help kind of give you a mentality or change as a coach? Like what, what kind of experiences that year give you? I think every coach should go through a year like that. Mm. And I, I always say that and people will say, man, why would you say that? Because I think it teaches you so many valuable lessons. Um, the way that winning can teach you lessons and what it's like and what it looks like and what it feels like to win at uh, elite level or win a championship. Um, I also think that having a year where you're at rock bottom or what it feels like rock bottom can be really beneficial because it's extremely sobering and um, teaches you the values of what's important, uh, teaches you the importance of recruiting, um, that uh, your, your ability to coach uh, as dictated uh, and in the way that your successes uh, evolve are, are dictated uh, by, by one thing, and that's the quality of the players that you have. And uh, so I've, uh, that, was, that, was, that was a really beneficial year looking back on it because, you know, it's, it's humbling. And I think um, part of, uh, you know, being successful over long stretches of, of time, and certainly I'm just starting my head coaching career. So I, hopefully I can apply this, but mm -hmm. the guys that I admire there, there's a, there's a humility um, that's required. And I think when you go through years like that, uh, you learn real quick that it's uh, it is what it's about the Jimmy's and the Joe's not the X's and the O's. Yes. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that was, that was a, that was a really uh, tough year to go through, but I think I learned from my boss there, Todd Kowalczyk, his perspective was tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, his, his ability to keep uh, focus on the big picture was, was, uh, really helpful. And, uh, you know, he never got too high or too low that year. And it really helped our growth in, in, uh, subsequent years after that, I think because of our approach in year one. And we already discussed how successful he's been. Obviously Toledo's now a respected program finishes top of the conference, probably top three or four, just about every year. Now he even has got some guy like Ryan Rollins, who will probably be an NBA player this year. But to see the jump you guys made in year one to year two, to go from four wins to going to the team and wins over 500 at 19 wins that next season, what changed in that locker room? Was it just a lot of players changed? Was it just the mentality, the culture was then established? Or how did you guys make a 15-win jump the next year? Well, we had, uh, we had three players sitting out. So mm -hmm. that was like in – that was pretty much the entire difference in our whole season. Mm -hmm. um, we had two transfers from Green Bay – um that were that were high level ryan pearson and matt smith and then we had a transfer that sat out uh from romulus high school that uh transferred from iowa state dominique buckley uh who actually incidentally played for for nate oates uh yeah. at romulus high school so uh those three guys uh plus the recruiting class that we had coming in um and a couple of the holdovers from that year one um elevated us big time but you realize very quickly how uh two or three guys can make uh that much of a difference in terms of uh you know the success that your program has um you know it's a good reminder for all of us that it only takes a couple guys in our sport it doesn't take uh 10 or 15 guys uh, of a certain talent level um so yeah so then 2013 rolls around and then you get the opportunity out there to go to Illinois, your first high major job now in the Big Ten. How do you get the opportunity out there with Coach Gross then? So, uh, yeah, and that was all actually due to Dustin Ford, uh, who was a friend of mine through the business. He had helped me. Uh, he called me one time in the spring. I was at Toledo uh, after year three and called me up and said, hey, would you would you have any interest in this job? And it was a you know, it was going from on the court coaching to now off the court, uh, where I was an assistant to the head coach. Yeah. That was, um, it was a little bit of a calculated risk, right? Because my path to being a head coach, um, it wouldn't necessarily help me by going off the road. I'm not more hireable from going off the road. So um, it was an uh, opportunity for me to take a step back in order to go forward. 
Mm. Okay. And that was the part um, that I would say, um, you know, I'm, I'm really appreciative of Dustin and, and his uh, foresight to, you know, he suggests my name to, to John and then to, to help me get the job. So I'm always thankful for that because um, he, he played a big role in me getting that opportunity. But at that point, I felt like I needed to uh, get out of the Mac. Um, I love the Mac, but I was in the Mac for 13 years, um, three different schools, four different stops. So it was like at that point, like, hey, I need to I need to progress. And um, I did. And it opened up another door for me two years later at Butler. So um, it was a calculated risk, I guess, but um, one that at that point in my life, I was willing to take and, uh, you know, it benefited me in the long run. I know for not a lot of people, they don't necessarily understand what this isn't to a head coach is. Obviously, see the listing or the title name or whatever it might be. But what exactly is your role? And at the same time, how did you grow as a coach then by spending those two years or three years out there kind of growing and developing that aspect? Sure. So it was a great opportunity for me because I got to work uh, for John Gross, who I had admired John uh, when he was at Ohio, dating back to Ohio State. He was highly successful as an assistant coach. And then he went to Ohio University and had two great runs in the NCAA tournament um, and then advanced on to get the Illinois job. So I had an admiration for him. I didn't really know him all that well. I knew him somewhat. Um, but uh, having a chance to work for him, he's a tremendous mind. John has a great mind uh, for the game. He is always on. He is always thinking about basketball. And he's a he's truly a lifelong learner. He is an unbelievable uh learner. I mean, he, he has a high capacity for learning new things and new ways of doing things. So um, it helped me because it gave me a different perspective. Number one, number two, it gave me a different viewpoint. I was now off the road. Um, I was more in tune with John and his daily life um, and how I could help him and make him more efficient and make our program more efficient. And uh, number three, it was all basketball. So I think in those years, I really grew as a coach from a basketball standpoint um, because I studied the game morning, noon, and night. I studied our program. I studied other programs in the Big Ten. I studied other programs nationally and, uh, you know, was able to kind of learn uh, a whole different way of doing things through John and through his lens. And uh, that helped me out a lot. Yeah, it helped me a lot. So there were a few NBA guys that you also were being able to kind of be around throughout that time out there. One guy specifically I want to go into is Kendrick Nunn. Obviously, Malcolm Hill was there alongside him too at that time as a fan too. But being around Kendrick Nunn, who had a unique journey to becoming the guy that he is today, or obviously had a little bit of up and down season this past year at LA not getting to play, but he created his name for himself a unique journey. So you were with him out there in his beginning parts of his college career at the Illinois. What was it like being around him? Oh, K. Nunn was great, man. He was uh... – he was a smooth operator um, and had no fear. And you can kind of see that in his game and how it's evolved now at the next level. He plays with no fear. Um, he was a scorer. He could score points rolling out of bed. Um, tremendous score. Um, and we, I don't know, his freshman year, I think we thought, you know, he's got, this guy's got a real future about him. Uh, did you see it being an NBA future and, and having the, the type of uh, – success that he's having now uh potentially but um you know he earned that it wasn't anything that uh was handed to him and he earned that um his career uh took some twists and turns in college he finished of course at oakland mm -hmm. but uh kendrick's a kendrick's a, a a heck of a player um learned a lot from being around him just his approach to the game and um how he carries himself and and the swagger he plays with and he, he never gets too high or too low. You know, he was very, he, he was probably as steady mentally as any player I've ever been around. He, he, he would not show frustration. Um, you know, and I think when he was having great success, he wasn't impressed with himself and that was able to, you know, it was able to help him, uh, you know, because it kept him going and kept him hungry. Um, but he was as level as any player I think that I've ever coached or been around. If you could pick one player that you've coached throughout your entire coaching career so far that you had to go count on to get you one bucket, so one point to win your game right now, who are you picking? Whew. That is a, a good question. Um, and I would probably say EJ Liddell. 
Mm -hmm. probably say EJ Liddell. EJ, a lot like Kendrick, uh, had an ability to to score the ball. I feel like um, he he yeah EJ EJ can drop twenty on you. You know, rolling out of bed. Uh, Kendrick Nunn was very much the same way. Keelan Martin uh, was an unbelievable scorer as well. Um, the guy that uh, we recruited at Butler and uh, coached him there for his first year was uh, Kamar Baldwin. Kamar uh, could go get a bucket and get to a spot as well as as any guy I've ever coached. Um, Malachi Branham, I'd put in that conversation as well. Um, and Malcolm Hill was a, a tremendous player, but his – Malcolm, the fruits of his labor came later in his career after I was I was gone. Malcolm's an unbelievable worker. But, yeah, those are some of the guys. I would say E.J. Liddell, one, uh, probably Keelan Martin, two, Kendrick Nunn, three, Kamar Baldwin, four. Also, at the same time, you got to spend time out there in Illinois, obviously, where you're back at now. How big do you think that's going to be? Understanding, like, well, much relationship aspect. you got to get to know some of the local high school coaches, the AU programs, whatever it might be. Sure. How big do you think that's going to be? Kind of getting that experience at the same state now. Obviously, you've been in the same region, but now, especially in that state now, how big will that be kind of going forward not throughout your next stop at Illinois State? Yeah, Shoes, I think that'll help um, because uh, I've been there and had a chance to meet a lot of high school coaches. In the role I was in at Illinois, uh, I was in charge of camps and clinics. I was on the phones a lot, talking to coaches as well. Uh, you know, working within in the rules of what we I could do from that position. I wasn't out recruiting, but, um, you know, was able to meet a lot of those coaches through some of the clinics that I attended and, and the camps that we ran. So uh, I have a somewhat of a knowledge of the state. Uh, we hired a guy on our staff, Rob Judson, who I think knows the state and the coaches within our state uh, as much or more than any coach uh, I could have hired. And uh, he's got a a tremendous feel for the state of Illinois, a long history uh, with his family and, uh, you know, have, having played in the state. He grew up in Illinois. He played at Illinois. So um, I'll, I'll lean on him a lot for that. But certainly having been in the state for two years, do I think that helps? Uh, yeah, I do. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting a lot more coaches that than I, you know, even, even know so far. So, um, yeah, a lot of great coaching in, in our state. So as you said, you took that step back in a sense at Illinois. Then you decided to get the opportunity then out there at Butler and you get the first time really officially being united as the head coach, assistant coach duo, Coach Holtman then at that point in time. So how did you get the opportunity and what came to allow you to become now the assistant coach out there at Butler? Yeah, that was all through John Gross. Um, there was They had a kind of a strange year. Uh, their head coach at Butler had some health issues. Uh, Chris got promoted to interim head coach. Ultimately, about halfway through the season, got promoted to being full-time head coach. Um, and I remember asking John, this is kind of late in the season, maybe late February, early March. Uh, we were in the locker room one day after practice, and I asked him, I said, hey, what's what's Holtman going to do with his spot? Do you know? And he said, you know, that's one I could help you with. He said, I could definitely help you with that one. And, um, you know, lo and behold, I got a call from, from Holt. Uh, right after the season and said, Hey, do you want to meet up at the final four and met up with him, talked to him. Um, and I've known Chris, I've known Chris for, for a while mm -hmm. through our uh, years as, as assistants in the Mac, but I knew him and um, you know, we met up at a steak and shake uh, in uh, Indianapolis and um, you know, I was hired. So yeah, I was lucky, uh, kind of a right place, right time. But more importantly, I was uh, in position uh, to, to, to be considered for that because I worked for John Gross. And John was, you know, one of his very best friends in the business. So, again, goes back to relationships. I don't know that I've ever been hired uh, into a job uh, just, you know, blindly. It's always been because of someone that I worked for or worked with that helped me, you know, with that job. And I think that's a great lesson, too. And you've obviously spent all the, all this time up until today now with Coach Holtman. So I want to go a little bit into him and his impact on your life now, because in my opinion, I think he's one of the more underrated head coaches in the country. Obviously, he doesn't have the big NCAA run yet or obviously win a national championship yet. But his success year in, year out each year has been phenomenal to watch. Obviously, the way he's developed guys too and the NBA player has been great. So learning from where you get to see the development of NBA guys, where you get to see success in tournament appearances – how has that helped shape you into the coach that you're now today? Well, he's had a great impact on my career. Um, 
from a mobility standpoint and having a chance to become a head coach for sure. But he's had such an impact on my career just from a um, approach standpoint and a uh, X's and O's standpoint and a operate how to run and operate a program on a daily basis. Um, he's got a, a, a tremendous way with people. He's got uh, a consistency about him and a truthfulness about him and a, um, you know, a, a realness about him that I think people appreciate. Uh, he's very genuine, authentic. And, uh, and, and he coaches in truth. And I think players really respect that. So he has, uh, had, uh, he's had great success at Ohio state. He's had very consistent success. I know that, uh, you know, he's maybe we haven't had the success we wanted later in the season in, in, in March that will come for him. I don't have any doubt on that. He's, he's, he is elite level and I, I have no, if ands or buts about that, uh, he's an elite level coach in this country, and uh, everything that he deserves will come his way. I, I know it will, and I just have the utmost respect for him as a as a human and as a coach, and, and certainly for the effect that he's had on my career. If you could pick the biggest thing you've learned from him, what would you say that is? I would say it's ability to coach in truth. You know, I think people. Uh, respect uh, and I say people players but uh, people and parents and coaches respect um, when you're direct and, and honest with them and that's something I think that uh, that's how he operates he operates he said he'll tell the players you know I, I'm going to coach you in truth uh, at all times and if you do that you can look a, a young man in the eye and he knows that what you're saying uh, to him is is coming from a place uh, of, of, of honesty um, that I think that those players will respond and, and respect uh, your coaching, um, you know, uh, more than uh, the alternative as if, if you were, you know, kind of skirting around issues. So if they know you have your, their best interests in, in mind um, and you coach that way, you live that way and you interact with them that way, then, um, you know, I think you're you're on your way to being pretty successful in our business. Obviously, there's now potential you can kind of help influence the schedule that you guys create now. So is there a chance for everyone to see an Ohio State, Illinois State match if we get to go up against Coach Holtman? Maybe, you know, not this year, <laughs> not this year. I got to we got to get our roster set and uh, uh, get our feet on the ground. But maybe in the future, if uh, he would have us back. Yeah, I think that'd be something that would be that'd be great. Be a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, we got to get him over to Redbird arena. That's what I need to be working on. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, work, talk him into it somehow and, and, uh, get him to sign some sort of contract to come over to Redbird for a home and home, but I don't know if he'll ever do that or not. <laughs> well, let's go into year one with him then out that Butler. And you already mentioned him one time, but Keelan Martin obviously has been a player. I started establish himself in the league. You guys get to coach him in that first time there. So walk us that a little bit, like getting to coach Keelan Martin then and, seeing the way he grew then for those two years you were out there, what was that like? It was great. Um, I learned so many valuable lessons uh, at Butler. Um, and, and, you know, people have heard this before, the Butler way. Um, but the Butler way, uh, it, uh, it influenced me uh, as a coach in terms of just uh, program approach, program philosophy, uh, lessons that I was able to learn, uh, what you can accomplish. Uh, you can accomplish far more with less. Um, you know, uh, if everyone is aligned in, in that program and everyone's committed, it taught me very valuable lessons that um, I've taken with me. And we certainly took with us to Ohio State. Um, and uh, and uh, it was it was great. It was a great experience. I think the culture was in very much so in place and it was set there. Um, you know, as an assistant coach, I tried to add to that in any way I could. But the reality is looking back on it, that, that uh, culture, that locker room probably taught me more mm -hmm. um, than I taught it. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. So um, I, I, I learned, I've had a lot of friends that coached and played in that uh, program over the years. And uh, that place uh, is very, it's a very special place. It's special to me and my family and, uh, you know, thankful for our two years there and, uh, what a what a great place that was. You mentioned something I do want to ask you about, and that is how there are some programs do you think of that kind of have a culture ingrained, and obviously sometimes because a coach has been there for so many years, but 
talk about obviously we hear the brotherhood all the time out there at Duke. We hear La Familia or whatever it is at Kentucky and Butler Wake. Those different types of slogans and sayings that kind of represent and kind of categorize what their, their what their identity is and their culture. How much would you say a head coach determines that? Obviously, if it is something where a coach moves on, retires, whatever it is, a new one comes in, is it just that that coach is kind of already self-established and the coach kind of just fits that culture? Or does a new head coach kind of bring upon a new culture into that program then? Well, I think each coach uh, that Butler had in those years, I'm sure, had their own um, their own mix and uh, of, of attributes that they brought to the table, for sure. Right. Uh, they were, each of them were very distinctly different. Thad Mata, completely different than Todd Licklider. But I think the umbrella that they operate under, um, the beliefs that they had, the values that they imparted on their players, mm-hmm. those were very much ingrained in the, the program before they got there. Mm-hmm. And um, I think each of those coaches was able to recognize that they were a steward of the program. And it was their responsibility to uphold the Butler way. And, uh, you know, the Butler way is, you know, I think any of those slogans, anyone, uh, we've, we've certainly heard a lot of slogans across the country. Um, and some of them are, are, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, mm-hmm. and as opposed to others that, um, you know, have a, have a very identifiable DNA that uh, plays itself out onto the court. But I think at the end of the day, shoes, um, programs that can live out uh, what they're preaching um, and not only on the court, but off the court as well. And uh, programs where you have that alignment between administration, um, staff, and then ultimately players and imparting that onto the players. Uh, those are the ones that are built to last. And, you know, you see that with highly successful programs across the country, not a lot, uh, but there's a few. And uh, those are, those are really, uh, you know, the programs that are built to last. This next move probably makes a little bit more sense how you can track it a little bit. Obviously, Coach Holman gets the job out there at Ohio State. You fall with them, and that had to be huge for you too because this is going back home now for yourself. You get to be even closer to family and home. How did the opportunity come to you, and just what was it like knowing that you got to go back home now? Oh, uh, it was that was once in a lifetime. I think um, in in our profession, you don't uh, dictate where you go. Uh, the job sort of dictates where you go. The opportunity does. So for me, uh, growing up, I grew up in Columbus, 15 minutes away uh, from Ohio State campus. Uh, I was uh, a diehard Buckeye fan growing up. I was a ball boy uh, for the team for a couple of seasons as I was growing up. Uh, You know, uh, to have a chance to come back and coach in that program, uh, what a blessing that was. And I was I was so uh, thankful, Uh, you know, being there for five years uh, was was awesome. Uh, having your friends and family around. Um, I tried to soak it in as much as I, as much as I possibly could. And I, I felt a real responsibility to do my part and uh, have our staff do our part uh, to uphold um, what was uh, built before we got there and uh, do it with class and dignity and, and in a way that, um, you know, Buckeye fans like myself growing up uh, would be really proud of because I know that, um, for people that uh, are fans of Ohio State and guys like myself that grew up in Columbus, um, I, I can understand and appreciate um, how passionate they are about the Buckeyes. And it was a unique view for me uh, uh, to be able to kind of live out a dream that I had. And uh, yeah, it was, those were some great years. And I, again, say the word, I'm very appreciative of uh, that opportunity and sort of how it all unfolded. So uh, lucky to be in that position and, and uh, you know, um, I wouldn't have, uh, you know, had it any other way. The guy I worked for, and, uh, the program that we, we were building there at Ohio State, I believed in strongly. So uh, I'd be pulling for those guys uh, big time as I watch them moving forward. There's going to be a few guys we're going to touch up on throughout your Ohio State career you coach, but the first one is, is a guy that I feel like most coaches love to have. He's not necessarily the go-to score, the all-commerce possible player of the year, but it's a kind of a, a culture foundation for you guys. And that was Kyle Young for you guys. And you guys had all five years because of his COVID year, they just got, you guys got to spend with him. So you were there with him as a freshman all the way until he graduated as a super senior. Now, what was it like just seeing the impact that he had in this program, in the locker room on the court, but he still was a great player too, but just seeing the impact he had on this program, what was it like growing with him? It was awesome to watch the transformation um, 
of, of him uh, as a, not just a player, but as a young man. So I tell this story a lot, but as a freshman, Kyle was, Kyle was a real homebody. Um, he was a mama's boy. He lost his father when he was in high school. Um, but when he got to college, um, I think felt a real responsibility to take care of his mom and watch out after his mom. Uh, and I would joke that his, you know, the, the, the summer leading into his freshman year, when guys come in June and July and they're lifting it, uh, we would always lift on Friday mornings and you have an early lift and then the guys could go for the weekend. They would leave as long as their classes were done. And most guys have online classes. And I would joke, I'd say, tell his mom, his pickup truck was already, he left it running so that as soon as he finished with lift on Friday, he could jump in the pickup truck. He was already packed and he could get back to Ken. Uh, and, and he, he was, uh, he was going back and forth. I think he really struggled uh, as a freshman, that not just that summer, but the whole year, um, considered going back home, playing maybe at a small college and then, you know, li living with his mom. Um, but he had such a, such a wonderful heart, you know, and I think as he matured, um, and was able to see that his mom was, was okay. She was doing all right. Um, she had family with her and was surrounding her and great friends up there in, in uh, the Canton area. But, uh, Kyle, he matured as a young man as well. Um, and now he, he actually has a girlfriend, a real serious girlfriend that he um, started dating, I think end of his junior year and then uh, had a, had a child his senior year. So uh, he's a, holds a really special place in our family's heart and in our program's heart as, as coaches um, and uh, his blue collar uh, approach, his mentality, the toughness and, and uh, selflessness that he played with um, you know, I think we'll we'll be showing film highlights of him for a long time, just based on uh, you know what he gave and what he brought to our team and and our program as a whole. There are a couple other guys on that team that are now NBA players. One of them is Kita Bates Diop, who obviously has been developing greatly now, obviously through the Spurs. Being around a guy that was one of the best, with the best defender in the entire country that season, was a one heck of a player. Obviously, an NBA level talent too. What was it like coaching that kind of player? Kata, um, you know, it was our first year at Ohio State, and Kata had, had a, I would say, a modest career to that point. He was a top 25 player in the country coming out of high school, um, but sort of had battled some injuries and maybe had not hit his stride with his, uh, you know, his college career. And um, he just hit a, he hit a, a real stride in that redshirt junior season um, where he went from, being a good player to being an elite player. It was Big Ten Player of the Year. Um, but I think more than anything, maybe what my, one of my takeaways from that year is uh, what, what uh, the importance of confidence can do for, for a young man. Yeah. And you could see this snowball start to, you know, get bigger and bigger and bigger. And he just kind of immersed himself into that season, didn't worry about anything else. He's another guy that was not impressed with his own success, uh, he embraced uh, what came his way. Um, and as he got uh, more and more attention as the year went on, the bullseye on his chest got bigger and bigger. And he answered the bell every time. So uh, he had a season to remember, you know, six foot seven and a half with a seven three wingspan. Mm -hmm. He looks like an alien walking around there. I would joke with him all the time with his, his wingspan was ridiculous, but uh, he was able to impact the game in so many ways. And, uh, He's a part of the Spurs organization. It is not a surprise at all. If anyone who knows Kata or his family knows, uh, he is a special young man. He is a great teammate, a uh, tremendous teammate, and uh, an unbelievable talent as well. There was another NBA player also on that roster who had a unique journey of how he got to the NBA, but now has established himself, and that's Jay Sean Tate. So you're around with him. He obviously still was a great player at college. Obviously, God had different plans for him in terms of how he's going to get to the NBA than other guys do. But did you expect him to go on to have the type of career he's had now where he's established himself in the NBA as one of the cornerstones of a young up-and-coming Rockets team now? Did you see that in his future? Or are you even a little surprised at the way he's developed now? Well, we always thought um, that if he could get – if he could find his way through – uh, a few years uh, after college to develop his jump shot and continue to work on his game. We did think that that was a possibility um, to this level, maybe not, you know, and that's, that's a credit to Jay Sean. He is a self-made 
uh, young man, like as a, as a man and as an athlete, he's a tremendous uh, athlete, uh, was an unbelievable football player as well, but, um, worked at his basketball game, uh, to, to, and has earned what he's got, uh, here in, in the recent years with the Rockets. So, uh, I believe he's on uh, tap for a, a club option this year, this summer in the off season. I think he'll, he'll get that from what I've, what I've been, you know, told, and uh, he's going to he's going to he's going to make some serious generational money. Um, but he's a he is a uh, he's an elite athlete. Uh, again, another high character guy uh, and a, a great teammate, uh, not a selfish bone in his body. That kid plays to win, always has and always will. And, uh, you know, he's a very valuable member of their their organization. When you look through your coaching career, what player would you say shocked the most? Rather that be they were a high school recruit that maybe you thought would be a development piece, was going to be decent, but turned out to be a star for you guys at college level or became an NBA player that you didn't expect. Maybe if you want to go to the Antonio Gates situation, became a Hall of Famer. Like who, what, what player would you say has shocked the most with the way that they panned out rather at the college or professional life career? I would say Antonio Gates would be at the top of that list for for completely opposite reasons than you would think uh, that's because we had, we knew he was a football player in high school, but um, you know, when teams are, you know, coming in to take a look at him uh, you know, as almost like a throw in on, on Kent state's pro day that they had with the football players um, you know, I, I think you think, man, maybe he'd have a chance to play in the NFL. That'd be cool. He could try out with the Browns or whatever. Um and then they kept coming back and kept coming back. And you're like, whoa, man, he might have a shot. I watched Antonio Gates. His, he didn't get drafted, but I watched his free agent contract come through the fax machine. And uh, I think it was like a fifteen dollars or $20,000 signing bonus. And I remember at the time thinking, whoa, man, this is unbelievable. They must really believe in him. And, you know, long, long story short, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. So I would say him for that reason. Uh, I would say a close second would be Malachi Branham, who is going to be likely a lottery pick in this year's draft. And we certainly thought he could be an NBA prospect, uh, thought probably two or three years down the road. But uh, what he did in one season at Ohio State, uh, going from a virtual unknown before the season started to being um, now a top 10 or 15 pick in the NBA draft in one year, um, I don't think any of us saw that coming, including anyone in his family. Uh, and they would they would tell you that same thing. They thought he could do it, but uh, I don't think anybody saw it coming this soon. So, um, yeah, it was a it was a great uh, you know that was a great ride, a short ride with Malachi, but it was awesome to watch it develop and kind of see how quickly it came together for him. Year two, you guys get a freshman point guard that comes in that becomes a great player for you guys now at the Pacers, and that's Dwayne Washington. So. You guys obviously come off a year. You guys went to the second round against first Gonzaga and year two, he comes in and obviously has a great season as well. What did Dwayne bring to that team then as a coach, you need to have like that cornerstone point guard point guard. Now, how big was that for you guys as a coaching staff? Well, it, Dwayne brought an immediate uh, confidence about him. You know, if you know, Dwayne there, you know, that there is never a shot that he's ever taken that he did not think that was going to be bottoms. And, uh, he fires from anywhere and early in his career, anywhere, anytime. Uh, and we had to kind of pull him back a little bit, but uh, <laughs> as, as his career developed, I think you saw what you saw was a, uh, a much healthier balance between shot selection and ultimate belief in himself versus um, what was best uh, time score situation in that moment um, and how that kind of correlated to winning games. And he was, uh, he was really fun to coach, man. Uh, really fun to coach. I think his parents knew that he needed work. His dad uh, had a cup of coffee in the NBA, was very successful as a professional player overseas and uh, in the CBA, a little bit in the NBA. His uncle is Derek Fisher. So he's got this pedigree um, that uh, would show that he's uh, he knows uh, what it takes to get there. His dad, uh, I can remember there were plenty of games as a freshman and sophomore where Dwayne didn't play well or didn't shoot well or um, needed some strong coaching. And his dad, I'd see him after the game. He'd say, this is why I sent him here. This is why I sent him here. You know, I got ultimate faith. And, and I think that, uh, and, and his mom was, was tremendous with us too. But that, that was, I think, as much as anything, 
having a support system that could support their son, but also deal with reality. And the truth was that he needed growth and he needed this, uh, this, this process of coaching where sometimes guys don't want to hear it, but uh, if you're, they're not changing behavior, like Dwayne early in his career, we'd have to pull them out of the game. And that's, that's like total opposite of how we would want to coach. But um, it, that was how we had to teach some of those hard lessons in the moment. Yeah. And uh, he was better off, I think, because of that by the time he was a junior. And I still say this, Dwayne Washington as a junior scored more points in the Big Ten tournament than any player in the history of the tournament. Mm -hmm. I think it was 109 points in four games. So it was, you know, he was a bona fide scorer, uh, a high level shooter. And I think you're seeing that play out at the NBA level. Um, he was undrafted, uh, signed a two way contract. And halfway through the year this year, the Pacers ripped that up and signed him to a three year deal. So I think you're seeing uh, not only what type of player he is now, but also their belief in what he can become. You obviously had a lot more experience than I have in terms of this aspect, but you mentioned a key piece there that there are a lot of players that are very good players. Like in my opinion, I think there's, there's a lot of players that have a shot talent wise, God given gifts to possibly play in the NBA. The ones yeah. that make it though, is a, as a mentality and a mindset that some naturally just have, but for the most part, it's, it's the surrounding cast that they put around themselves, rather that be the parents, the family, the brothers, the agent, whatever it might be in the case, it's that surrounding cast where, it's okay to hold them accountable because it's not guys, no one's going to be perfect. They need to change and develop and be molded into an NBA level mindset. But how critical have you noticed now coaching a lot of guys that had that NBA professional talent? How critical is it to have a strong supporting cast that is willing to say, you know, you guys need to be coached. You guys need to be developed, put different work in whatever it might be. How critical is that for a player in the long-term success? Well, I think it's, I think it's very important. I think we all need to understand that parents, um, look through the lens of what is best for their child. That is, you know, I'll be no different as, as a, as a father, although I hope I have some sense, uh, but your, your parents, most parents are always looking through the lens of what's best for their child. And um, the reality is what's best for their child sometimes is um, learning hard lessons, right? That's, that's life. That's life. And I think we all um, as human beings, we need truth tellers in our lives. And um, sometimes that doesn't come from um, their home. You know, it doesn't. Sometimes those are enablers and uh, people that are uh, contributing to the poison that's being put in their in their minds. And I think you see that a lot. Uh, to your point, Shoes, I think there's, um, you know, sometimes there's, there's, there's family members that can get in the way of a young man's growth, and not for any harmful reason at all. Yeah. Uh, not for vindictive reasons at all, but more because they out of love, because they care for them and want it so bad for them. And the reality is um, your greatest growth comes in moments of adversity and time periods of adversity. And adversity um, can be a valuable teacher. The Dwayne Washington, kind of what we've been talking about here, that situation and his growth came through uh, adversity. And, um, you know, if we're not learning from adversity, then uh, I would question, you know, when they do face that adversity, how will they respond? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think it's one of the one of the uh, most important um, attributes a young person can have, whether that's in high school or in college, um, you know, is give me an example of when you've battled real adversity or you face real adversity. And um that's a question we ask in the recruiting process. And the reality is most 17 year olds coming out of high school, 18 year olds, they haven't faced a whole lot of real adversity in their lives. They haven't, yep. they can bring up a time when they didn't play as much or they got benched for this and, you know, they're right back in the game. And, you know, the reality is their high school teams or their AAU teams need them to perform. Uh, so they haven't, most guys haven't faced true real life adversity. And I hadn't, when I was coming out of high school, I didn't know that at the time, but um, when I was humbled, I think uh, as a competitor, uh, when I got to college, uh, that taught me a lot of very uh, valuable life lessons that uh, maybe didn't feel great at the time, but looking back on it, um, were really beneficial for me. And, uh, I think all, all young people, you know, do need to go through things like that, that 
um, can, can they really, those moments will really define you uh, as a competitor, but more importantly, as a person. Uh, the next few seasons I really do want to get into because of obvious COVID reasons and all the chaos that brought upon you guys as coaching staff. But the player, the last player I want to get into before I talk about that is EJ Liddell, who came in right before the COVID season ended up starting and all that stuff. So you guys get now what's going to most likely be another first round pick this year. And EJ Liddell comes in, you still have Dwayne Washington and company. What was it like as a freshman getting him in? Because obviously as news, he was a high recruited player, he's a great player coming in, but obviously turns into one of the top players in the entire country that by this past season. What was his addition to this program like? Oh, EJ, uh, his addition um, right away, it brought a stability to our, our locker room. EJ is a, um, he is an engaging personality. He is an everyday guy. He's um, a tremendous person to be around. He is very high character. He was raised that way. If you know his family, you know uh, exactly the type of people they are. It, it, it was imparted on EJ and how he was raised. Um, EJ's path was not uh, as, as uh, smooth as maybe you, you know, one would think. Early in his season, uh, his freshman year, um, his minutes were a little bit inconsistent, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and that continued as we got into Big Ten play. Um, some games not playing as much, not nearly as much as he would want to. And uh, by the time January and February hit, uh, well, January, he I remember there was one particular time he came into coach and he said, Coach, what do I need to do to play? That was the only time uh, EJ ever uh, asked a coach or came into his office on his own doing it. And uh, he said, you need to practice harder. He said, you need to, you need to practice harder and you need to earn more playing time with your practice habits. Um, he wasn't going hard enough in practice. And consequently, uh, that was uh, affecting his playing time. Here's EJ Liddell, a guy that was the one of two guys to ever win Mr. Basketball in the state of Illinois twice. Um, he was a two-time state champion a highly decorated high school student athlete. And now he comes to Ohio state and he's playing like at the times, like eight minutes a game or somewhere around there. Yep. Um, and, and uh, how, again, going back to like what we talked about earlier, how he responded to that defined his career. Like it is, as, it, it is as simple as that, how he responded. He didn't point fingers. He didn't blame. He didn't make excuses. Uh, his parents weren't threatening for him to leave. Now, I'm sure there were conversations going on behind the, the, the scenes that, uh, but, but that wasn't, that wasn't brought to, to our uh, attention uh, through EJ. EJ wanted to win and it, it was really, really, that was important to him. So um, after that meeting, things really changed for him. And by the time February and March rolled around, he was one of our very best players, even as a freshman. You don't have to necessarily list any names and all that, but would you say there are more guys that I'm sure there's been a lot of guys that come and talk to coaches about why am I not playing? Can I get more minutes, whatever that might be. Would you say there's more guys that take that in and say, you know, okay, I'm going to take this advice. I'm actually going to go out and prove it. If that is in the practice court in games, off the court, whatever it is, or are there more guys that say and start doing the point the fingers or as we talk, as we kind of know now, go and enter the transfer report or whatever it might be like, which one would you say you've seen more of as a coach in the most, most likely in the most past couple of years now? Well, I think, I think, you know, the answer to that is, is I think, you know, when we look up and we see 1500 student athletes in the portal. Um, you know, I, 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 this is a whole different conversation, but I think some of the rules that are in place right now, um, you know, aren't uh, reinforcing the values that I think are most important in uh, growth and development. And uh, some of the things we've talked about here, um, you know, uh, you know, fighting your way through it and figuring it out, um, not making excuses, not pointing fingers, looking within, uh, responding to adversity in the right way. Those are life lessons that are time-tested that will um, separate people yep. in this world that we live, okay? And uh, our, our little world of college basketball here is no different. And I think for young people, um, finding their, blazing their own trail, you know, finding their own path, um, fighting hard for that, you know, fighting hard for what they believe in. It's not to say that uh, no transfers uh, should happen. I think transfers can be a really good thing at times, but I think um, we've enabled this, um, 
uh, mobility uh, in our sport at such a high level that I think it's um, it, it's it's on the verge of becoming really detrimental to um, young people's growth. And that's the only part I worry about is is that um, I think uh, you know support the student athletes and and their uh, right to um, you know transfer. Uh, but I think that in some ways, I think uh, the ease that they can transfer with um, is is potentially detrimental to their growth um, and their development. So, and that's the lens I try to look at at this through. And, and teaching and coaching, I try to look at it through the lens of what's best for the student athlete. And there's times where that is. Um, and I think sitting out a year um, is appropriate because uh, you know it it. it it, it, it makes it a little a little bit less mobile and you know you may weigh it out and say I need to I need to figure this out and fight for this spot or get better maybe sometimes it's me it's not the system or the coach or uh, the situation and uh, I think that that's a great life lesson well Ben as I mentioned the one of the biggest things obviously of our generation comes into play for you guys and that's COVID-19 which ultimately ends and is your first you're not officially going to the tournament obviously that's probably what I've had it not occurred but you guys are going around this whole situation and then COVID comes into play doesn't allow you guys to go to the tournament shuts down the season how does the staff do you guys react to that because I know I've heard from a lot of players of obviously they want to go to the tournament they would have loved it sucks for seniors all that type of stuff but how's the coaching staff you guys go through that it was a space that we've never you know encountered before mm -hmm. none of us and um you know, I think we we did the best we could. I think all coaches around the country, you, you navigated that thing day by day. Yeah. Um, you tried to stay connected with your team. Uh, you tried to make sure your your guys were upbeat, uh, that they were staying positive, and uh, that they you were communicating with them and staying connected with them. That was important to us at that time. We we did some fun things as a team on Zoom. We had get-togethers. Uh, you know, uh, we checked in on one another, you know, it's certainly that's a, that's a period in all of our lives that we'll look back on and, and, and you, you think back on like, man, what, what that time period was like, it will never, hopefully never experience <laughs> something like that again. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, there, there were definite effects of it for, for all of us, some of those, uh, physical, probably some mental, probably some emotional and, um, uh, you know, I think the the important thing is that uh, we were able to gain some sort of uh, normalcy through uh, our sport and through competition. And that uh, that helped that helped all of us. You know, I think that helped all of us uh, players, coaches, fans. And, uh, you know, th thankful for that. And certainly the role that our, our healthcare professionals and doctors played in that it uh, was 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 it was tremendous because that was such a. Uh, kind of a crucial time in, in our in our history. As you mentioned, the thing about COVID is that I think we look back now and obviously no one wants it to occur. If we could remove it, it would have been best. But there were some memories that were created that some that were good memories that some people were able to find the good and the bad. If you look back at pretty much that, what, two year span, obviously because last year was, or two years ago, I was kind of chaotic all year with the protocols. What, what would you say was your favorite or best memory that you guys were able to create as a team, as basketball coach and one player specifically, or just what was the best memory when you look back at COVID that you formed as a team or as a coach now? Ooh. Um, I have memories. I think, you know, some of our zoom sessions that we had when we were all separate, I think, um, you know, just some of the, the, the odds and ends that you remember, like I remember doing individual workouts with gloves and masks on. And I, I was like, I cannot believe this is going on. And then getting tested every day for a whole year, basically a whole season uh, at 7 a.m. on here on campus. And the people that made that uh, a reality and possibility for us to do, that was uh, crazy. Um, you know, going, going and having uh you know, shutdowns and in, in, in going through stretches where we, we practiced together and then had three or four people that could practice together or missing players or missing coaches for practices or games. It was so odd. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what you take from it overall was that you found a way to navigate through those tough times. And um, again, being a part of something bigger than just yourself 
not, not one of us could have got through that um, if we were alone. We had to rely on so many people around us to, um, to uh, make it happen. You know, the NCAA tournament, the bubble that we lived in. Wow, what a, what a uh, production that was. It was unbelievable. And uh, just really, uh, you know, humbly and thankful that we were uh, able to, to play under those circumstances. So, yeah, those are some of the thoughts, maybe in memories that I, I take away from, from uh, that COVID, the COVID time period. So you guys were able to play in that tournament by the end of the COVID season then, and you guys go up against Oral Roberts and have the unfortunate upset, obviously, of one of the better Cinderella teams we've had in a while. When you guys were going through that game and you guys see what Max Asmus was able to do, obviously, and what he was putting on that game as well as Kevin O'Banner and company. But what was it like just a just getting to go play in the bubble experience and also just getting to go and play against a team like that? Um, you know, it's funny because I deleted that whole week uh, out of my brain. So I can't I don't even really remember that shoes. Um, it's something that I, I certainly don't um uh, have fond memories of, uh, but Oral Roberts was, was tremendous. They were, um, you know, deserving. They beat us. They beat Florida. They went on uh, to play in the sweet 16, I believe, almost the elite eight, almost beat Arkansas. I believe. Yeah. If I remember. And um, you know um, yeah, it's something that you wish you didn't have to go through, um, but maybe going through it teaches you some lessons for later on in life, a little like that four and 28 season with, with Toledo, yeah. um, you know, it certainly doesn't feel good. Doesn't feel right. You know, Kentucky just went through it this year with St. Peter's 15 beating it too. And, um, but um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I think it was a, it was a real eye opener and it taught, taught you some really valuable lessons that um, and in that setting in that format, uh, nothing else matters, not the numbers, uh, by your name on the seed line, not the names on your jerseys, not the size. Uh, what matters is uh, which team plays better for that 40 minutes and how fragile that is, you know, and that's, it's, it's a stark reminder for, for all of us in, in, in sport and in competition that, um, uh, you know, and I don't, I, I think we had appropriate respect for them. I, I, I don't think that I, I, I know we did. Um, now were we at our best that night? No, we were not. Um, but they were a big reason for that. They played at a high level. They were a very good team. They had a couple high level players that kind of pulled the, pulled the weight for that whole, uh, that whole game. And, uh, they deserved to win that night. So, yeah, um, you know, unfortunate lessons that you learn, but, um, you know, I think hopefully we can all be better because of experiences like that. Well, we got a couple more Ohio State questions to wrap up before we get into Illinois State. And one of those is that we talked about him a little bit ago, but Malachi Branham, he comes in and he obviously was phenomenal, especially you could just see the growth he had from the first game to the second and going forward, obviously the way he played by the end of the season. And he was someone that I thought should have been a five-star coming out of high school. I thought it was great. I don't know who's going to be a lottery pick per se, but he was right. a great talent. You guys obviously brought that out of him. You guys now have the duo of him and EJ Liddell was great. And obviously the rest of the group too, but you guys get Malachi in there. Talk about him a little bit, like just seeing the way he grew throughout that freshman season. What was it like experiencing that? Yeah, I think um, a couple things. Uh, I think there's some things that enable uh, a year like that to happen. Okay. And first of all, tremendous talent. So uh, his talent uh, drove that. Okay. But a little bit like Kendrick Nunn, where I said he wasn't uh, impressed with his success he was very steady and stayed the course, uh, never got too high, never got too low. That's Malachi Branham. And uh, his, uh, you know, his, his welcome to the Big Ten moment came against Wisconsin, zero points. I think he played 11 or 12 minutes. Um, and uh, I know for him, that was a huge learning lesson, right? Um, and then shortly after that, we went on a COVID pause. He wasn't playing tremendous in, in November and December wasn't playing at a high level. I think he was averaging four or five points a game mm -hmm. and went back to his trainer. Um, we had an extended COVID pause and he went back to these 5 a.m. workouts, um, working out every day, kind of centering himself. I think in hindsight, I think it kind of centered him with his work ethic, his mindset, his approach, got him back to doing what, you know, what he knows. And that's just putting his head down and working. 
And his stats after January 1st, when we got into playing Big Ten games, which are tougher opponents uh, as a whole, and you're facing elite level defenses and teams that know you more than non-conference opponents. And uh, to see his numbers rise the way that they did, his efficiencies rise, I think I think it's a tremendous credit to him um, and how, he, again, how he responded to adversity in November and December. So uh, his response dictated the outcome. Um, and I think uh, that's a perfect example of how staying the course and, you know, um, not getting too high or too low during the course of a season, how that can impact your, your, your ultimate growth. So you now look back at all the ups and downs and the memories that you create throughout your Ohio State career. What would you say is your favorite one you made? There's a couple, I would say, uh, you know, beating the number one team in the country twice. We beat Duke uh, on our home floor. We beat mm -hmm. Michigan State. Um, I think we beat Michigan State by 15 or 20. Uh, we beat Villanova by 20 or 25 at home. We won at North Carolina by 26 or 25. Uh, I think it's the largest loss uh, that they've ever had in the Dean Dome. Uh, those those were great memories. Um, so we had some great we had some great moments. I think what I take from my years at Ohio State was uh, the relationships uh, that we that we built, and uh, you know the, the the teams and the camaraderie we were able to build. Um, and with that came individual success too. But uh, you know, um, not necessarily the other way around. Your, the individual success became as a result of of our team success and five NBA players in five years. And I think that program is is going to take off on a trajectory that. Um, you know, is, 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 it's going to be in a great place here in the coming years. And they've got a great staff. Uh, they've got a roster that I think is, is, is built to, um, you know, be successful over time. Um, and, and also, um, you know, they've got, they've got some exciting, you know, new, new blood in there as well. Some five freshmen this year that are coming in that will inject some energy into that program for sure. Well, now we're cops to today. And so you got to take us through how you got this opportunity now, because you're at Illinois State now, you're the head coach. How did this opportunity come to be? And how did you ultimately now become the Illinois State head coach? Well, Illinois State made a made a change, um, you know, head coaching change during the season, which is fairly rare. Um, and they made they made the decision early on. Um, I uh, had asked my agent to you know reach out on my behalf, um, uh, to the search firm, he did. And, uh, the search firm, you know, communicated, uh, through him and then, you know, talked uh, with me a couple of times and set up an interview and, um, uh, and, uh, it all happened really quickly, to be honest. I think I talked to him for the first time, maybe on a, on a Saturday and, um, you know, within five days or so, um, I got offered the job. So, and this is all while, this, this, our season at Ohio State was still going on. So um, it was a series of uh, phone conversations. Um, I knew when the job opened up that I, I would be really interested. I, I had no idea if I would have a shot or not at it. Um, you know, jobs are very hard to come by. And I think there's a, a mold or a profile, you know, based on your experience or your age uh, that uh, you may fit or may not. You may be looking for an experienced head coach uh, or, you know, someone like myself who hadn't been a head coach, but a longtime assistant. And I just, again, was kind of right place at the right time there. And uh, then when you get into the room, I think you've got to be able to articulate your vision for what, what you what you see the program becoming and um, do it in a way that um, connects with how they view it as well. And uh, I just have learned through those experiences to just be yourself um, speak from the heart, be as authentic and genuine as you can. But uh, this is one that I was very passionate about. And, uh, you know, I was really excited about. We brought the culture aspect quite a bit throughout this interview now. So now that you've taken bits and pieces from the countless coaches that you've coached alongside assistants and head coaches, now you've been coaching under, what is your coaching want established not Illinois State? When you look at this program as you start getting the guys that are coming in soon this summer to first summer workouts and then heading into next season, what is the culture that you're trying to build at Illinois State? Yeah, I want to build a culture. Um, I want to build a culture that's built on, you know, having the right people in the locker room. Um, that the, the character uh, of the young men that we bring in, they've obviously got to be uh, high-level basketball players and, and a talent that can help us get to go 
where we want to go as a program. But the character um, of the men uh, that, are, that we'll recruit, uh, it's not something I'm willing to compromise on. So uh, we've got to do our job as a staff in terms of identifying who those guys are uh, and, and, uh, and then recruiting them you know, to be a part of, of our family. But, you know, our, our culture will be built on accountability, on toughness, on competitiveness, uh, a blue collar mentality. Uh, we want to recruit guys that want to be coached, um, guys that are everyday guys that are embrace and approach the team concept. Certainly there's a individual aspect to our sport, uh, but I, I don't want guys that are solely focused on that. I want guys that um, embrace uh, the, the, the element of winning. I want guys that winning's important to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, th that's how I've been sort of raised through, through this profession. Um, I'm convicted in, in how I feel and uh, I'm convicted in the type of program that uh, we're going to build here at Illinois state um, um, and I, I have a very clear uh, view of uh, how that can be done. And uh, we're going to stay very, uh, very disciplined in our approach to getting that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're part of a great university, high level academics, uh, great basketball support. We've got a tremendous administration, um, guys that I work for um, and, and people we work with that uh, can help us get there. I know that they can. And uh, we're, we're fortunate to be in such a great league. We respect the Missouri Valley Conference and the coaching that goes on in that league at a high level. And it's going to take all of us uh, to get to go where we want to go. And um, and we're really excited about, you know, what the what the future holds. Uh, something I was like wrapping discussing is building a legacy for yourself. And obviously you just got this. You're probably not even considering leaving or when that day might come, if it's retiring there, or whatever it might look like. But when that day does come for yourself, when you decide to move on from Illinois State and go somewhere else or retire, whatever it might be, what is it that you want to be remembered for? What do you want to be, what do you want the fan base and the, and the school and the community to remember you for, for what you accomplished both on the court as a coach and also at the same time off the court in the community? You know, I look at it probably shoes through a lens of what uh, our, I would want our players uh, to remember me for. And I think if, if, if I'm looking through that lens, all the other stuff will happen organically. Um, I want I want our players most importantly. That's that's sort of the way I, I view that is I want our players to understand that um, first of all that I care for them uh, at a high level and that family is really really important to the people we're going to surround them with. Right. Um, but that I care for what's best for them, uh, not only in their four years here at Illinois State, uh, but beyond and uh in their lives as they grow into uh, leaders and fathers and husbands and hopefully ceos or uh you know managers or uh presidents of companies so um that's sort of the lens i look through it uh, as i want them to know that i i will always have their back um that i love them as as they're as though they were our own children and um and the, the, the culture that we're going to build is, is going to be based on um, people and surrounding them with the right people. And I think that if you do that in life, if you surround yourself with uh, great people, you know, there's a, there's a famous quote by Woody Hayes. And he said, uh, for, former football coach at Ohio State, he said, you win with people. And that's my, probably my favorite quote in life. And I believe it at its core. If you surround yourself with the right people that uh, are like-minded people that are going to push you, uh, coach you in truth, hold you accountable, uh, and love on you, uh, but be there to tell you the truth at all, at all, at every turn. Uh, I think if you surround yourself with those people, great things are bound to happen. And uh, you know, beyond that, I'll let every anybody else judge me for uh, what they want to judge me for. But I know that if I'm approaching it with that pure heart um, and and doing it and through that lens. Uh, you know, that's where my, my sort of my satisfaction comes from and uh, taking a, a pure approach. It's, it's uh, going to be honest to myself. Absolutely. Well, Coach, I got one final question for you. And that's when you look at this next season, what are your three biggest goals that you have set for the upcoming season? You know, I, I probably have one goal and that is that um, this will sound really generic, but um, you know, I want, I want us to be the most committed 
locker room in America. And if we're the most committed team, and that's something that we directly control um, as a group, if we're the most committed team to how we want to play, um, how we want to how we want to carry ourselves on and off the floor, uh, the type of teammates that we want to be, uh, how invested we're going to be in winning, how committed we're going to be to the values that we're going to impart on our program. Um, if we're the most committed team in America, we're going to have a chance to win a lot of games. And uh, beyond that, I'll, we'll let the chips fall where they may, um, but we'll live with the results. And, uh, you know, that's that's my one goal. So I'm not skirting your question on three goals, but uh, that's that's the one goal that I have uh, for this team this year. I believe if we do that, we'll be able to maximize our potential, whatever that may be. Absolutely. Well, Coach, congratulations once again on the head coaching job. I'm excited to see what God's got in store for you throughout your time at Illinois State. And Appreciate you taking time to come on today. Thank you, Shoes. I appreciate it. And you do a great job. I sure appreciate all that you do for, you know, for our sport and for, uh, you know, student athletes that are coming up the ranks. Uh, we, we we watch your stuff a lot. And um, I think you do a great job with what you're doing. And keep, keep it up, man. Appreciate it, Coach. Y'all's welcome on. God bless. You too, man.